Welcome back uh, to this Science Business public webcast titled Industrial R&D Europe First with a question mark. Uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the previous sessions. We are here Thanks, back uh, from a studio in Brussels, but uh, we, we will be moving around uh, this afternoon since we'll have um, several plenary sessions that will be run from uh, Romania, from London, from Munich. Uh, this is uh, just... But, uh, before we kick off the debate, I introduce uh, and, I, and that I introduce the, the moderator of the next session. Uh, just a few information from me. Um, first of all, today's conference that is about exploring this concept of technology sovereignty is uh, the first step. It's the launch of a major new science business initiative uh, that really uh, will be uh, aiming to uh, to take stock of the outputs of today's discussion and propose concrete actions for European R&D to take a step forward uh, in the right direction. So this is, uh, uh, we have a very dense agenda ahead of us. Uh, we, you, you can follow um, the, the rest that is happening uh, on Twitter uh, using the hashtag SBTechSov. On our blog, we've created a live blog that science business journalists are feeding throughout the, uh, the conference with highlights uh, of the debates. And just finally, uh, I'd like to, to thank the sponsors uh, for that make uh, this conference possible. And the, the five sponsors are Attract, EIT Health, EIT Urban Mobility, uh, the bio-based industry joint undertaking and the innovative medicines initiative. So this morning we heard uh, two of the main protagonists uh, in shaping the future of the European Programme for Research and, and Innovation, Horizon Europe. So we heard from the Commission and from the Parliament. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Florian Zubascu, online editor at Science Business, who will be interviewing the third voice in this debate, the German presidency of the EU. Florian, over to you. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Florian Zubascu, I'm online editor at Science Business, and for the next 25 minutes or so, I will be your host uh, moderating this session. Um, I hope the workshops before uh, the session were productive. I also hope everyone had a time to uh, grab some lunch, because now it's time to get back to the main topic uh, of uh, this conference, uh, that is technology sovereignty. Um, we have heard this morning the views of the Parliament and the Commission. And now we will turn our attention to Germany, the country holding uh, the presidency of the Council of the EU until the, until the end of the, the, the year. Uh, to find out its views on technology sovereignty and what the EU should do about it. Um, and I am very pleased to welcome uh, Thomas Rachel, who is Parliamentary State Secretary at Germany's Federal uh, Ministry for Education and Research. He supports the German research minister in fulfilling uh, her duties in relation to the German parliament on such topics as the science system, higher, higher education institutions, um, and uh, research uh, organizations. Um, and so without further ado, I would like uh, to invite uh, Mr. Rachel to tell us how Germany would like to strengthen uh, the technology sovereignty of the EU. And, uh, and my first question would be, by definition uh, of the German uh, of the German presidency, what is uh, technology sovereignty? And can you list a few specific examples? Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to present the view of the Germany EU presidency of, um, on te technological sovereignty. Um, discussing Europe's technology sovereignty is of particular relevance uh, uh, for two reasons. In recent months, uh, we have experienced challenges to global and, uh, value chains. It has become obvious we need so-called fallback capabilities. These capabilities, especially for public goods like health, or security 
require a European approach. And at the same time, we realize that the global competition for technology has become uh, fiercer and fiercer. Europe risk falling behind in the medium term in areas of technology that will be important for the future. The German EU presidency has therefore made this one of its priorities. Europe's future research and development policies should preserve the EU's openness vis-a-vis -vis third countries as a key asset. In addition, we should discuss ways to expand Europe's technology sovereignty in selected key areas. For example, a secure communication infrastructure and a trustful European data space, Europe should be able to provide its own approach. Excellent research innovation serves um, services in key technologies such as trustworthy microelectronics or high performance computing and quantum computing lay the foundation to achieve this goal. Against this background discussion about the budget of Europe's major program continues, it has never been more important for the member states to pool and coordinate efforts in research and innovation. We really need closer cooperation. We need faster cooperation. We need smarter cooperation. Another obvious example is the development of the vaccines uh, for COVID-19. Our task is here to mobilize the necessary research capacities and to develop technologies for protection, innovative treatment and medication. From this perspective, openness vis-a-vis -vis third countries while preserving a reasonable degree of technological sovereignty is a critical factor for Europe's resilience and competitiveness. Technological sovereignty and openness, there are two sides of one coin. Take, for example, the 5G technology as another example. And European innovation ecosystem should ha harness the competences, potential and technologies we already have here in Europe. We must create the right framework conditions for an effective innovation system, both legally and in terms of standardization. And I call on you as stakeholders from industry, from research and society to work with us on building this ecosystem. In the informal meeting of the research ministers on the 21st of July, we discussed the important role of the European research area. We'll have to play and strengthen Europe's resilience. We discussed a concrete proposal to launch a member state driven R&D initiative on resilience and crisis preparedness in response to Corona uh, pandemic. And it really received a strong support. The division of effort among uh, member states and between them and the EU plays a vital role in building a more dynamic era, which is an important political priority for the German presidency. Let me put this idea of resilience through research and innovation into the context of the topic of this conference. No, it's not a simple Europe first or something like that. We have to reach out. We have to find partners. We have been in discussions with the African Union, for example, about energy issues. We discussed climate issues. Every European answer will have and has to have a global impact. And sovereignty does not mean exclusiveness. International cooperation and openness will be an integrational part. Now we have only six months for all our ambitious targets. However, let me assure you, we are really working very closely together with our trio partners on an 18 month agenda in the European Union. And we are confident that our initiatives will continue in the future presidencies. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Rafael. You mentioned the European research area. And if that is going to be the framework 
uh, through which the EU can strengthen its technological uh, sovereignty. Uh, will the German presidency push for higher R&D investments in member states of at least 3% of the GDP? Yes, I think we have to motivate all the member states to invest more in R&D because uh, if we want to get out of the crisis, the corona crisis and the economical crisis in which, in which we are, we need uh, a lot of uh, in, uh, investment in uh, R&D. Um, the 3% th uh, uh, target and in uh, particular the share of public investment will therefore continue to guide action in the future. Uh, it's important that programs and measures such as the partnership initiatives remain open and attractive for the participation of partners from all other countries. And we are really committed uh, to this. Uh, and it's also important that uh, we better uh, make use of synergies between the various research and innovation programs which we have in the European Union. In preparation of the commissioners, um, Commission's communication on the European research area, the member states have chosen inclusiveness as a new priority. We are really confident that the Commission will propose new measures, especially for this point. And, and what that inclusiveness would entail, uh, specifically for uh, the Horizon Europe program? Well, um, I think you feel and realize that the member states intend to play a key role uh, in supporting Europe's technology sovereignty. Um, we think uh, that uh, throughout Horizon Europe and Eureka and the European Commission's invis invis uh, continuing to work as partners for supporting bi- and multilateral cross-border innovation programs, between uh, innovative SMEs on the one hand and large business and knowledge institutes on the other hand uh, to explore new cooperation op opportunities. I think the uh, Eureka initiative uh, is a good example for cooperation and also of synergies between the member states and the EU research activities uh, um, and um, within uh, the Horizon Europe program and also the European research area. So you're saying that this push for uh, a coordinated effort in technology sovereignty could look like uh, the Eureka uh, initiative? Yes, that's, uh, this would be very helpful. Um, and uh, I think there will be a, a big willingness of the EU member states doing this. Okay, uh, I would like to go back a little bit and ask you, how do you see this strategy for uh, technology sovereignty working with Horizon Europe and how does it relate to the EU's plans uh, for the next long-term uh, budget? Uh, is the EU, uh, is the planned budget fit for this purpose? Well, the budget is not yet decided. As you know, uh, we had uh, decisions um, by the leaders of the different member states, but now uh, the parliament is on the floor and we have that so-called trialogue to find final solutions. Um, but um, as I mentioned, uh, we, we need R&D um, initiatives on resilience um, and it's, it's, uh, it's it, uh, it's essential that we implement it by uh, Horizon Europe. Um, for example, uh, we have to strengthen the European structures for data exchange, uh, for cooperation in IND. We need uh, more uh, efforts concerning uh, European cooperation on health issues. We are uh, we all. Uh, realize the big problems which we have with COVID-19 crisis and we can only solve uh, the problem and find new uh, vaccines and medicine uh, working very close uh, together. Um, and um, I think um, we also have to work on R&D initiatives for crisis prevention. We have to prepare 
to be prepared for uh, such uh, situations like we had them now. It can be an environmental crisis, it can be social crisis, it can be economic crisis or uh, a health crisis like we had it now. So uh, to say it in short words, uh, greater technological sovereignty is by definition a goal of the, uh, Horizon Europe and it's designed to strengthen Europe's innovation capacity. Um, and so uh, we, uh, we are looking forward uh, that we will be able also to finance all this by the multi-annual financial framework and the next generation EU program. Um, but as I said, we are still in the discussion with the European Parliament to find uh, a compromise. I see. Uh you mentioned uh, that the EU uh, needs to uh, come up with, a, with more R&D initiatives uh, for crisis prevention. Uh, in what framework should these uh, uh, initiatives work? In, in, would it be in Horizon Europe or in other uh, programs? In general, uh, Horizon Europe is our uh, research frame program, but we have to work on the question if we can find synergies between the uh, research frame uh, program on the one hand and other, uh, for uh, example, structural funds uh, in the EU. Uh, I think this will be, will be a challenge, um, um, but I, I think it's worth doing so. Okay. Uh Regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the crisis that uh, is now following, um, um, I would like to ask you whether, um, do you think that the pandemic has given more momentum to this push for technology sovereignty? Um, are member states more willing to support it because of, of, the, of the pandemic? Um, I think yes. But we are in a debate also concerning other political uh, subjects. Um, but uh, if we are honest, uh, excellent research, uh, education and innovation, they are really the key factors uh, in order uh, to come out of the crisis and to achieve a sovereign and resilient and a sustainable uh, Europe. All the big uh, problems and challenges can only be solved by education, by technologies, by innovation. Um, and uh, therefore, I realize that uh, the willingness, the political willingness in the European countries is going up to support these. Also because we see that we are in a big uh, phase of transition, of transformation because uh, the digitalization uh, changes uh, quite a lot of things. Um, the energy question rises up, we need new answers. Um, and uh, even the climate question is in the, in the room. Um, and we will be only able to come forward with these uh, challenges uh, if we invest in innovation. Okay, I, I would like to circle back to your uh, the, the point you made about uh, cooperation. Um, could this policy backfire by worsening trade relations internationally um, or proving more expensive than EU member states uh, really want to pay for? Um, um, well, um, technology sovereignty, uh, has also challenges um, because first and foremost, uh, the EU is and must continue to be the most open economy in the world. So openness uh, makes and keeps our companies competitive and innovative. Um, But we also have to realize that we have to strengthen our own possibilities uh, and we need uh, technology sovereignty in different fields uh, so that we do not get dependent on other continents uh, in the world. Um, European and particularly also German companies will be the first to suffer uh, when we will be banned, uh, being banned from other markets. 
so um, we have to respect uh, the VTO rules. Uh, we support the principles of openness, um, but we also uh, think that we should have the willing uh, and the will uh, to defend our sovereignty, and this is also sovereignty uh, of technologies. Okay, um, and now uh, for the German presidency, what are uh, the next steps uh, that uh, Germany will take to implement uh, these um, technology sovereignty initiatives? Um, well, the first one will be strengthen the European research area. We will have a minister conference on the 20th October and adopt council conclusions on the future of the European research area. Uh, our trio partners uh, are committed to taking these initiatives further and implement them in the year of 2021. And let me give you another uh, example. We have already observed a push for digitalization in many areas. We need to drive this push further to strengthen excellence also in education and training. Digital learning or learning with digital means uh, throughout all phases of our life will play a very important role in this context. A skilled workforce with a mix of academic education and vocational education and training is key to ensuring the future viability of our continent. And this is the reason why the topic of uh, digital education across all levels uh, of education, including vocational education and training, is another key priority of the German presidency contributing to Europe's sovereignty and competitiveness. Uh, okay, well, one final question. And um, again, I'm circling back to uh, a previous uh, point that we've discussed, uh, and that's how much member states are spending on, on R&D. Um, what strategy um, is the German presidency going to use to convince member states to, to up their uh, R&D spending uh, in times of crisis? If, if we look at the previous uh, economic crisis that hit Europe uh, and the world, uh, a lot of countries uh, in Europe have, have reduced, have, have shrunk their uh, research budgets. Uh, so how do you think uh, now, uh, you know, with the help of, of the German presidency, uh, member states could be convinced to, to not repeat that same mistake? Well, all governments will get the question of their population. What do you do to improve the situation in the country and uh, to improve the economy's uh, situation? And if you have a look on the um, situation and the development when we had the finance crisis, those countries who didn't, um, who um, further on um, gave a lot of money in innovation and research were much more successful than those countries uh, who reduced uh, their investment in research, uh, universities uh, and innovations. The innovation is the key factor in order uh, to support competitiveness of member states and all of the, the whole European at a whole. Um, and if we combine this investment in the member states and in the European Union, in R&D, in innovation, with tackling and answering the big competitiveness questions of the industry, of the companies, uh, combining it with the Green Deal, uh, so giving answers uh, for the climate question on, and the energy question. I think we have the big chance, on the one hand, to improve the situation of our economies, on, on the other hand, to find the public support by the population, by the people, to go this way. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we are uh, nearing the end uh, of this session uh, and we should uh, move uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, we will uh, move to the next panel. Uh, so uh, I hope member states hear your uh, message and we look forward to uh, seeing the conclusions um, on these files uh, this fall. Uh, again, thank you very much for your time today, um, and uh, thanks to uh, thanks to our audience for joining this session. Uh, and I think now it's time to get back to our uh, studio in Brussels, where my colleague Marilyn uh, will uh, introduce uh, our next session. Uh, thank you very much. Bye.